Welcome back to the Quantum Guide Show. Today, I don't have a guest for you, but I have an interesting program. I'm going to talk about some of my very interesting transdimensional adventures. And I'm going to give you three examples, which are completely different, just to show you the kind of range of experience that can happen to people who reach out and I don't know how exactly I do it, but I have these amazing transdimensional adventures. So I'm going to be sharing um, some of my adventures with you, starting with um, when I visited a funky little metaphysical shop where I met a golem. And the next adventure is a day that I spent with some intergalactic children and their community in a different on a different world, a different planet. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about a template that I learned about while on a transdimensional visit to the big ship, which is a possible way to bring peace and harmony to planet Earth. So hang on to your hats. This is going to be interesting. And without further ado, I'll start with my first um experience that I want to share today. Now, before I start, I guess I should clarify that I was not under the influence of any kind of psychedelics while I had this experience. Um, all of my experiences, or most of my experiences, happen while I'm asleep. And I have different kind of dream states that facilitate this. Now, I have my regular kind of dreaming that's um, generally the stories uh, don't really make a lot of sense. They're just kind of disjointed. Um, they're kind of vague. I They don't engage my physical senses. I don't smell anything. Um, I don't really hear anything. Um, but I perceive that there's certain goings on. And they don't make a lot of sense. They're probably highly symbolic. And I'm sure that everybody else out there um, experiences very similar when they're dreaming. Occasionally, I will remember a dream and it will be fairly detailed, but nothing, nothing like my transdimensional travels. And it took me quite a long time to realize that my transdimensional experiences are real, very real. In fact, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to do a panel and invite some guests on who also share some of these very real, amazing experiences. But for today, um, I'm going to start off with a, a very recent experience that I had. And, um, oh, I forgot to mention, happy autumn. I guess we're into that time of year. I hope you're all enjoying the crisp weather or rain, depending on how it manifests for you. And the beautiful autumn leaves, if you're lucky enough to experience the four seasons. Anyway, I guess I should just get on with it. <laughs> So, um, yes, so the first experience that I want to talk about is an experience where I um, basically I was out shopping. I was out shopping with my son and he was uh, along with me to help carry my groceries home. And we were at the supermarket and it was very much like um, a real life uh, going to the local town and doing my shopping experience picking up the things that I wanted to buy that I normally eat. And then it got a little bit weird. And I started realizing that I was in a different reality. Now, I don't know if this different reality is another, um, another me in another world as part of the multiverse. I don't know uh, where this uh, experience actually happened. But it was very close to a real experience that I would have in my own um, community. So anyway, the first thing that tipped me off that I was not <clears throat> I was not um, in Kansas anymore was they had a display of these little um, uh, figures that were like gummies. They were edible and they were like in different little shapes. And but they were made out of um, seafood, uh, mostly fish. And my son and I, we tried a couple and, oh, it tasted gross to me. I did not like associating a jelly-like candy with the taste of fish. And I didn't really like them at all. And I didn't want to buy any. And my son, he didn't really like them either. So that was the first thing that tipped me off that 
I was no longer um, here, that I was there, wherever there might be. So then we're walking home and he's carrying my groceries for me. And I noticed there was an old, uh, older looking building. It was all made of wood. It had a wood porch on the front uh, with a few steps going up to the porch. And there was um, um, an area of, of the outside of the building that was just very plain and wood. And it had these big posters on it. And they kind of intrigued me. So I said to my son, I, I want to go check out those, those posters. So I climbed a couple of stairs and I looked. And I was totally shocked at what I found on the posters. Because those of you who are familiar with my channel know that to support my work and bringing you um, this content, I sell organ generators on my website. And here on this poster were these organ generators that were mine. And I was thrilled to bits. And there was a write-up, a little bit of a write-up about them. And at the bottom, there was my website clearly written and me as the contact person. And I kind of knew I wasn't in this reality, that I was in an alternate reality. And I was so intrigued that beings or people in alternate, um, alter, I don't know what you want to call it, alternate nows, um, are also familiar with my content and with my products. I was so thrilled. So I noticed there was a, a doorway close by, a couple of wooden steps going up to the doorway, and inside looked like a funky little metaphysical shop. And, um, and so I went in to inquire about who had put the posters up. And when I got inside, uh, it was a beautiful little shop. It was kind of a metaphysical slash apothecary. And there was like bundles of dried herbs um, hanging um, up here and there and around the front desk. And I could smell, um, I could smell feverfew and I could smell um, um, cinnamon and I could smell, uh, you know, other sort of smells like that. I could hear the noises in the shop. I was, my senses were fully engaged, which is my first um, you know, tip always to know that I'm actually in another dimensional reality. And there was a woman who was working behind the counter and she had long hair and was dressed kind of like a hippie and uh, no makeup or anything. And she was probably in her 40s, late 40s. And I looked around the shop and there were all kinds of shelves with crystals and, and all kinds of interesting things. And of course, jars with different kinds of herbal concoctions. Oh yeah, I could also smell chamomile. And it was just a really very, I got a very warm uh, sense being there. I really, really liked it a lot. So I went up to the woman working behind the counter and I said, do you know who made those posters that are on the outside wall? And she said, oh yeah, I made them. I went, oh my God, I am so thrilled to see that you're actually promoting my products. I said, because I depend on them, you know, for um, helping to support my podcast. And I'm just thrilled to bits that you've done that for me. I didn't even know that people were, you know, promoting my products. This is amazing. And she kind of smiled and she said, oh, no problem, my pleasure. And I went, oh my gosh, I I'm just so thrilled. Like I, I was like so appreciative of her efforts that I just didn't even know what to say. So I said to her, um, did you know that I also have some podcasts on my channel? And she said, oh, of course I know about them. She says, I've never missed one of your shows, Karen. I really, really enjoy them. And I was like, at that point, just bursting I'm going to get emotional here. <laughs> I was just bursting with gratitude. Like I couldn't believe that, 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 that there was somebody out there who watched all my shows. Like I know people watch my shows, but this woman seemed really committed to my content. And I'm just so surprised. And I, I said, Oh my gosh, I'm so surprised. And I'm so thrilled. And she just kind of smiled and said, Oh, no problem. I, I really enjoy your, your shows and I enjoy your content. You're a very interesting person, Karen. And I went, wow, it's so nice to be appreciated. So um, so I said to her, you know what? 
I'm going to tell people about your shop. I'm going to tell everybody on one of my shows about your shop so they know about it. Because this is a really cool little place to come. And you've got some funky looking books and some amazing healing products and crystals. And this is just a really cool place. And I want everybody to know about it. And she kind of kind of smiled out of the side of her face. And she didn't say too much because... I think she knew that I was visiting from my reality. I think she knew before I really got it. And um, so I thanked her again. I was just so thrilled. I said, I have to go. My son's waiting outside with my groceries. I don't want to keep him waiting too long. She says, oh, that's okay. And <laughs> this is the wild part. So as I'm going to leave, I notice there's this area it's not really uh, contained, but it's definitely an area set aside. I hadn't noticed it when I came in. And it was like a, on a platform that was about, oh, four feet by four feet square. And I noticed this little being in this on this platform in kind of a roughly constructed sort of a, not a building. It didn't have walls, but it definitely was, um, had a roof and it had, like wooden poles holding it up and he was busy doing something and I was so, just so intrigued and I went over and I looked at him and I watched him and he he just was the cutest little figure he was only like three inches tall but here he was building something and he was building something out of pieces of clay and beads and things like that and I was so intrigued I said to the woman I looked back and I said oh my goodness I've never seen anything like this she says, oh, yeah, that's our golem. And I said, golem? She says, yeah, we found him wandering around the shop one day. And so we decided just to give him his own little designated area so he could do what he does. And I went, oh, my gosh, is he alive? And she said, well, that depends on how you want to define being alive. And I said, well, clearly he's animated. He's building things. She said, yeah, he, that's what he does. And as he was building, he was so cute. He was muttering away. I couldn't understand anything he was saying. He was just kind of muttering rawr, 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 like that, right? And I said to her, um, and I said to her, um, um, well, do you feed him? She says, oh no, they don't, they never need to be fed. They just, they just do what they do. Like she was just like, this was very ordinary everyday happenings, you know, in 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 for her. And I went, oh, my gosh, he's he's just amazing. And I reached down to touch the thing that he was building. And immediately it sort of fell apart. And I, I don't know whether he jumped or I accidentally knocked him, but he went flying onto the floor and I felt real bad. So I held out my hand. He got up on my hand. I, I then put my hand back over the platform and he just jumped down and he went right back to building again. She said, um, so I asked her, I says, where does he get his building supplies from? She says, oh, we give it to them. We give it to him and we make them. And um, so we just make little geometric patterns out of clay and beads and things. And we just put them in there. And then he's happy, seems to be happy, content, just building. And I went, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. So I, I went out and I said, I'm going to call my son because I know he'd love to see this. So I called out to my son and he came up the stairs and he came in and he looked. I says, isn't this the most amazing thing you've ever seen? He says, yeah, it's really cool. So he puts down the groceries and he sticks out his finger and he goes to sort of poke the guy to see what he's made out of. So the little um, golem, he was uh, he looked like he was made out of red clay. But his face was kind of, you could see definite features. And um, as he put his finger towards the golem, the golem backed away, backed away. I said to my son, oh, oh don't do that. You might be scaring him. My son, my son says, well, I just wanted to see what he feels like. But he, so he pulled his hand away and the golem just went right back to building again. So um, anyway, so then we said goodbye to the woman. And as I was leaving, I realized this was totally transdimensional. I was definitely in a different realm, a different reality, a different world. I totally, totally knew it. So not long after that, I started to wake up. And when I woke up, here I was in my bed, in my pajamas, just like it usually happens for me. 
And I grabbed my phone and I Googled Golem because I, I sort of had heard the term before from watching anime or from, you know, uh, my daughter and her husband um, play Dungeons and Dragons. And I'm pretty sure there's a Golem in there somewhere. But I wasn't really sure uh, really what they were about. So I Googled Golem and I can't believe what comes up. Golems are part of Jewish mysticism. And they make these little clay figures that are about three inches high. And the clay is red clay, just like the color of the little guy I saw. And they um, give these golems, they put uh, symbols on them and they give them different tasks, like, for instance, protecting the household. I'd never heard about any of this. So it was very interesting that I had this transdimensional experience. And then I was able to verify what a golem is. Uh, when I Googled it back in my reality in real time. So I thought you'd enjoy that um, little experience. That was pretty cool. And uh, and all my senses were engaged. That's how I know when it's transdimensional and not just um, a dream or a hallucination or whatever. So that was pretty cool. So, um, so I wanted you all to know about her little shop. I don't know if you can go visit her. If you can, if you ever find yourself in the dream state and you and you see some of my I have some big posters, uh, you know, on a wooden wall and a door and a little metaphysical apothecary shop, go in and say hi to her. So and I know that somehow she's aware of the show. And so I said I was going to uh, give her a shout out. So I am. And I, I regret that I didn't get the name of the shop and I didn't get her name. I should have asked. But I just didn't think of it because I was just so um, overwhelmed with her kindness and um, and that she was so familiar with me. So I thought that was super, super cool. So that's the first uh, experience I wanted to tell you about. And um, the second experience um, I had while I was doing um, the away work on the big ship and um, you can learn more about that by watching uh, my other podcast called Aliens and Angels. But also I'm thrilled to tell you that I'm making really good progress on my manuscript. And I hope to publish this year sometime uh, my book all about these exp experiences. So for those of you who aren't familiar, I basically went to the big ship, um, what I call the big ship which rests in kind of an envelope between different dimensional realities and sort of an envelope of space um, as I perceived it. And while I, and when I went there, I went there while I was sleeping every single night for three months, earth time, our time, every single night. And then it stopped. And while I was away, there was a time dilation. So it was very much like three and a half years worth of experiences. And um, yeah, so when my book comes out, you're going to want to read it because uh, it's very, very interesting how I discovered myself there, how I went through the orientation. You know, at first I was really concerned because I had a cat at the time and um, I didn't want to be away. Nobody knew where would know where I was. And I was told that even though I was there for perhaps a week, two weeks, or even a month, that um, I would return, and wake up in the morning and find myself back at home. That's the way interdimensional, uh, transdimensional travel works. So um, while I was on the big ship, I had um, a number of different kinds of experiences one was what I call exopolitical ambassadorship, where I would meet with other beings and I would download my perceptions of being a person on earth in this time and this era and how I perceive things that were going on on earth into their um, uh, sort of data bank or recording system. And then I also... Um, uh, participated in um, what I call the um, the pre-settlement program, which is a program where we would go on expeditions and we would scout out um, different planets and do assessments and scientific work 
to prepare for the eventual settlement of humanoids. So these planets had everything, everything you could even or ever imagine except no humanoids. And we would do the work of um, um, gathering data so that we would, or someone could uh, figure out the best way to uh, immigrate humanoids without disrupting the natural systems in the biosphere. So, um, so anyway, and then then the third um, uh, uh, program that I participated in was actually resettling beings on these planets. And uh, it's way too much information to really get into uh, while I'm here, but I do want to tell you a little bit about, um, about uh, my second experience uh, that I want to tell you about today. And so after doing some of the pre-settlement uh, work, I actually got to go to a couple of different worlds and see what resettlement looked like from a low technology perspective and other worlds where I got to see it from a higher technology perspective. Because you can, when you emigrate um, to a new world, you actually have your choice as to the level of technology that you want to use uh, to basically rebuild or build civilization and uh, populate that world. And so there's quite a lot of free will and free choice for sure in that. Although everybody who resettles to a specific world, they all take the same level of technology. There isn't different levels of technology on a single planet. So, um, I'm just looking at my recording button here. It's flickering. So I'm hoping that um, it's recording properly because I'd hate to have to repeat all this. But anyway, so if you wonder why I'm glancing over, that would be why. Um, so anyway, so I want to tell you about one visit to a very low tech settlement and I enjoyed it so much. It was such a fabulous experience. Now I was there for about a week, but I want to talk about what happened one day in particular to give you a bit of an overview of what uh, one of these settlements might look like. Of course, they're all different, but this is the uh, the one that I one that I uh, remember very, very clearly. So um on this in this particular settlement and on this particular world, the climate is very mild. And this was um, a settlement that was near the ocean. And on this particular planet, there's a lot of vegetation and copious amounts of dew. So I didn't notice a fresh water source, but I did find out that they use the dew. They collect the, the morning dew. There's so much of it that they collect it and they use that for their fresh water source. And because of the amount of dew, all of their homes are built high up in the trees. And they're not at all um, rough or uh, primitive. They're very elaborate, beautiful homes that are built all out of natural byproducts of the vegetation below. And they're just these, these beautiful tree homes. And you get into really good shape climbing up and down the ladders. They do have some lift systems, you know, for bringing uh, things up and, and down. But basically, we didn't use them for getting up there or for getting back down to the ground. We just climbed down these ladders or climbed up these ladders. So anyway, I was um, basically asleep and I woke up in the morning and I heard children laughing. And so as I come out of my sleep state, I noticed there was like three or four of them gathered and they were looking at me and they were laughing. Now they weren't laughing at me, but they were giggling because they were really surprised at what I looked like. I looked so different from them. They had dark uh, toned skin and long, uh, kinky, more kinky than my hair today, um, uh, black hair. And they had large, beautiful, dark eyes, and um, they were ever so healthy looking. And they'd never seen anybody like me with long white hair. And my eyes compared to theirs were, looked very small and they were blue. And, you know, I've got freckles and I have very pale skin. And they were just really um, um, just kind of um, inquisitive and curious and giggling at the way I looked. So I woke up. 
And as soon as I was awake, they came and they'd grab one, grab one arm, one grab the other arm, and they pulled me towards the ladder to start the day because they wanted to spend the day with me. And I was okay with it. So we climbed down the ladder and we all ran. I ran in the same direction as them and we ran to the ocean and the sand, oh my God, the sand was black and sparkly. It was so beautiful. And the water was kind of a pale, kind of a green color. And the kids just pulled me and tugged at me and we just ran into the water and it just was so beautiful. It wasn't cold at all. It wasn't extremely warm either, but it was pleasant. It was just really pleasant. We swam around and we splashed each other. And this is what these beings do. Uh, basically, instead of having a bath, they start their day with a, a, a swim and a bit of a wash. And then after we were done playing in the water for a while, the kids motioned for me to follow. Oh, by the way, um, in these resettled worlds on the big ship, um, Nobody speaks English. Nobody speaks a language. It's all telepathy. Telepathy is the uh, universal language amongst all the different beings from different worlds and even dim different dimensions. Uh, words are so incredibly limiting once you experience telepathy, and it's such a fabulous communication skill. And I recommend everybody get used to it because um, and start practicing because um, you're going to need it with the changes that are coming in the future. So anyway, uh, they motioned for me to follow them and I followed them and we went um, back into a grassy area and everybody rolled on the grass. Now there's so much dew. Uh, it's like having another bath and it washed off all the salt. And we were when we were done doing that, we went back to the to the settlement uh but on the way we stopped and they showed me several different trees and bushes which some of them i had already become familiar with in in the previous days and we just ate fruit and berries and it was just sweet and delicious and very very satisfying and that's basically what they do they do have one meal a day i'll talk about that in a few minutes and um and this one meal a day, that's an actual cooked sit down meal. But the rest is just pluck stuff from trees and bushes and eat. It's everywhere and in abundance and very, very delicious. So when we got back to the settlement, there was um, basically the whole settlement. Everybody was awake and getting ready to start their day. And everybody was very uh, busy. And there was a number of different sort of projects going on. There were uh, people that were laying down these large grass mats to sit on and in sort of cleared areas. And they had piles and piles of these huge dried leaves. And some of them were pulling the fibers from the leaves. And um, other people were... Um, basically going over plans for building new structures, possibly new homes, I'm not sure, and deciding who was going to do what. I did notice that there um, there was no sexual division of labor, which means that there was no, like it wasn't women doing all this kind of work and men all doing that kind of work. People who, I call them people because to me they are people uh, or beings, whatever you're most, most comfortable with, you know, they just kind of decided on what they, what they like to do, where their skill set was their talent and they would just help out, but everybody had something to do. So a woman that I call mother soft eyes, and again, they don't have names. They have kind of, um, identifiers are a bit of composites from the way they look or mannerism they have or you know um if they have if they're known for their gentleness or their strength that's kind of all incorporated in a sort of a concept and that's how we identify each other i call her mother soft eyes because she had very beautiful soft loving eyes and she was the mother of quite a few children. And I just called her mother soft eyes. So anyway, she motioned for me to come over and sit down on one of these mats. And then she put a smaller mat on my lap and she put one on her lap. And then she showed me how to pull these fibers from these big giant leaves. And once we'd gathered a pile of the fibers, she was showing me how to roll them on my lap on the mat to form twine. They use twine a lot for lashing together, you know, poles before they um, add walls and um, 
I mean, yes, the supplies that they use for their building are what we might consider primitive, but at the same time, there's nothing primitive about the homes and the functionality of them. So maybe the twine was used for, you know, lashing um, uh, wooden, small wooden logs to make the, the ladders that go up to the different units or whatever, the basic structure of the walls, um, you know, are basically poles that are lashed together with this twine. They make this very, very strong twine by rolling the fibers on their lap, and then they would just keep adding them and adding them, and the twine would get longer and longer. Uh, some people were also uh, removing fibers from different plants that were much finer, and they were sort of rolling it and twisting it into thread that was going to be used for uh, making garments and carry bags and sacks and things like that but I was basically just working on uh, making the twine. And I didn't do a very good job, but Mother's Soft Eyes was very kind and she seemed to appreciate my efforts. And so I did that for a while. And then the kids came and got me and were pulling at me and just so eager to take me on the beetle hunt. So um, these beings are omnivores. They eat fruits and basically even some vegetable-like fruits, but primarily, I guess you would class them as fruits. And they also eat flower petals, all kinds of different uh, flowers in all kinds of colors. Uh, they also eat for nourishment, but they also eat, of course, they eat some seafood and some fish. And, um, oh, small flightless uh, birds that they catch. And, but their favorite uh, meal and the one they were preparing for this big feast we were going to have was the beetles. Now, the beetles are dome shaped. They're in a shell and the, the shell is very dome shaped. And they've got skinny little um, uh, bony legs, small heads, and they're just in abundance. So um, the kids, it's their job to hunt the beetles. So it was like a big honor that I got to go with them. And so we had like a little troop of kids and, and me. And we all went off down the trails to, to hunt for the beetles. Now on the way there, the, the kids showed me uh, which plants are good to feed from and which plants I should stay away from. And one of the plants that I should stay away from is actually carnivorous. They're carniv carnivorous plants. And they eat, also eat the beetles. So these beetles are in such abundance that um, plants, carnivorous plants eat them. Um, other animals eat them. Birds of prey eat them. And there's still tons and tons of these beetles. They're just super prolific. And the older a beetle gets, the larger its shell is. So anyway, we walked all through and there's flowers everywhere. And it's just beautiful. And the smells were so beautiful from the flowers and the plants. And it was just, I, I just love the environment. So anyway, I'm marching along with these kids and eventually we come to this clearing. And a couple of the kids had brought, um, help carry this big net and they spread the net out on the ground. And then we took our places on the outside of the nest, net, sorry, net. And we we're all squatted down and holding a piece of the net at the edge. And we were very, very quiet. And soon out from all over, just everywhere came these beetles. Now, some of them were only like a couple, maybe two, three inches in diameter, but some of them were quite a bit longer, like a foot or a foot and a half in diameter. And the odd one was even bigger than that. But when enough of them had walked into the net, we just pulled up our edges and put them together. And here was this giant net full of these beetles. Oh, I forgot one thing. Okay, so this is really cool. So, um, you know, these are very loving, kind people. And they needed to kill the beetles, but they did it in the most amazing way. So before we gathered up our net, the children all emitted um, a telepathic frequency. Now, I couldn't detect it. Um, I think you had to be um, around them long enough to learn how to perceive the, the frequency or how to make it. Or maybe it was a talent that they just had within their, you know, genetic makeup. I don't know. But the kids would emit a tone and um, all of the beetles went into a sleep state. And at that point, some of the older children, they had um, 
not knives, but they had like rocks that had very sharp edges. And they jumped up and they lopped off the heads of all these beetles. And they just tossed the heads, you know, here and there back into the wooded and, you know, areas full of plants, I guess, for scavengers to eat or whatever. And then we gathered up the edges and the, the older kids were so proud hauling this big haul of a net full of these beetles back to the camp. So as we marched into the camp, and I thought this was really interesting because although there's no speech language, you know, these beings are able to make sounds. They are able to make vocalizations. So uh, as we came back into the camp, all the parents cheered as though we were heroes because we had get, we had gotten the haul of food for the for the evening meal. And it was like we had done some great thing. It really wasn't that great. It was just a, a really interesting process. But all the parents were so proud and the kids were so proud, you know, carrying the beetles. So they spread out the net. And then all the kids got together and they removed the um, organ sacs from the beetles, put them in a pile, and they pulled off all the bony legs and they just prepared them so that they could set them aside for later for the evening meal. And then a couple of the kids um, gathered up all of the um, organ sacs and basically split left. Uh, I didn't know where they went. Mother Soft Eyes informed me that they put them out at the edge of the um, settlement for different kinds of, um, um, excuse me, different kinds of like birds of prey and other animals and bugs and whatever to basically scavenge the remains and that way everything is recycled. So that was the uh, the the beetle hunt. That was really fun. So um, by now it was early afternoon and um, some of the kids were getting sleepy and some of the old people were getting kind of tired and enough of the dew had uh, evaporated that I noticed that um, the older people were laying out these um, large sort of woven mats made out of some kind of grasses and um, uh, the kids and the old people all laid down and had a nap. And of course, I went and laid down, and had a nap too. And we slept for, I'm guessing, about an hour or so. And then we woke up and everybody sprang back into action. Now, the the juvenile, older juveniles, the adults, you know, they didn't seem to need the nap. But the old people and the kids, it was kind of sweet, you know, having this nap together on these grass mats. So um, after that, we, um, the kids motioned, come on, come on, you know, we got things to do. They didn't say it, but they, you know, motioned it. And so I went with them again. I, I just love being around the kids. And we went off and this time, oh, everybody had uh, these woven sacks and we were collecting beetle shells. So beetle shells are used for all kinds of things. They're very uh, iridescent, very highly reflective. And um, the, sh the shells that were intact were used for things like cups and bowls. And the larger shells, when we were able to find them, were very highly prized. They were used as storage containers. They were used for, um, you know, uh, larger containers for foods and fruits and different things like that. And uh, But a lot of the shells were broken, especially when we came near the carnivorous plants. So the kids um, and I, we just gathered up everything, broken shells, intact shells, everything. And we just gathered all that we could carry and we hauled them back to camp. And um, what's interesting is the broken shells are used for lots of things. Like, for instance, they line either side of the different pathways with them because they're highly reflective. And I don't know, uh, I didn't see anybody really going out at night, but I'm assuming that they also reflected like the moonlight and um, it sort of made the, the paths very, very visible. They also um, use, as I mentioned, use them for utilitarian things like as bowls and drinking vessels and, um, you know, storage containers and stuff, the intact ones. But some of the broken shells were also used to make very beautiful, ornate jewelry. And some of them that were, uh, you know, the smaller pieces were actually sort of ground into a powder. 
and they were uh, mixed with um, the beetle grease, which I'll get into a little bit later, and used as a cosmetic. So I thought that was super interesting too. So anyway, by the time we got back from that, it was time to start preparing for this big sit down evening meal. And um, oops, I'm running out of time. I better hurry up. So um, um, they have these big fire pits that are laid with these huge flat stones and the stones are just there all the time, but then they burn all kinds of things to produce the coals and the heat to warm up these big flat stones that become sort of the cooking surface. So the beetles are laid out, the adults do this, not the kids, because you know, those stones are pretty hot. It's full of coals and stuff, but the beetles are laid out um, in their shells all over these big, large stones. And then they cover the um the beetles up with these large other large leaves but these ones were green and more fresh than the ones we use for fibers and they just cover it all up and then the meat cooks now the meat from these beetles has a very high fat content it's quite greasy by our standards but very delicious but the beetles before they're cooked they kind of stink They've got a real musky kind of a stinky odor to them where you would never expect them to be pleasant to eat. But while they cooked, I guess there's some kind of a change in the meat and the smell was fantastic. It, I just thinking about it makes my mouth water. It was absolutely delicious. And while the meat was cooking, children and people of all ages would get together and some had gathered fruits and um, they sort of used the less sweet fruits for supper and a lot of flower petals. So everybody was like pulling, the kids were pulling the petals off the flowers, filling these beetle bowls and other people were, um, you know, slicing up the different um, less sweet fruits and getting them ready in bowls and things and getting the dishes, everything ready. We didn't use any utensils. When the meat is cooked, it's very tender and people just grab a shell and um, reach in and grab sort of mouthful, mouth size handfuls of this greasy meat and just stuff it in your mouth and eat it and grab some some other edibles, you know, the vegetables, all fruits, whatever. I mean, they kind of all grow on trees and vines and stuff. So I'm thinking they're probably all technically fruits. And then, of course, flower petals and the different flower petals, the different colored petals have different flavors. And so that was kind of like served as like like the spice that would go along with the foods. So um, anyway, so we all ate until we were totally full. And then um, uh, there's quite a bit of scraps left over. And a lot of these beetle bowls were not empty. You know, they had scraps in them and stuff. And then what some of the uh, beings did is gathered all those bowls up. And then Mother Soft Eyes told me that, um, didn't tell me in words, but te telepathically told me that they render the leftover greasy meat for the fat. And then the fats are used as like skincare products, lubricants um, to um, rainproof things, you know, all kinds of different things. Nothing is wasted there. And the legs, the bony legs that were pulled off uh, from the beetles, they were all different sizes. And they were used for all kinds of things too. Everything from toothpicks to, um, you know, things for fixing your hair to nails, what we would consider nails for the building projects, just all kinds, all kinds of things. And, um, so then after uh, we had the evening meal and we cleaned everything up, um, then there was a huge bonfire that was built in this big fire pit and everybody sat around the fire and they did a method of storytelling that I thought was really cool. So one uh, being or person started off the story uh, with um, providing, and this is all done telepathically, but providing a very vivid image uh, of something. So this particular evening, he started off with this sort of mountain that was in the center of this island. And um, so we all sort of saw it in our mind's eye. It was very clear. And then the next person would add to the story. And this went on and everybody had a chance to add to the story. And I thought, wow, what an amazing uh, community building experience as we went around, went around the circle. 
And when it came to me, I was quite proud of myself because I projected the image of a cave um, and the side of the mountain and out came, just popped out this big snarling um, grizzly bear with its with its claws out, right? And um, and I, I guess I did it quite um, well because the children all screamed, uh, you know, they were startled. They all screamed ah, when they saw this big bear and the adults just laughed and um, out loud. And um, and I was really proud of myself because I had uh, created this image convincingly to scare the children and amuse the grown ups. I mean, I wasn't trying to scare, scare the children. It was just kind of like, I thought it needed a little bit of a boogeyman in the story, right? So that's why I did that. So anyway, not long after that, we're just sitting around and uh, enjoying life. And um, the children start yawning. And and that's when we sort of would break formation and the children would get carried or kind of slowly climb up the ladders because it was bedtime. And I climbed up one and went back to the quarters where I was sleeping and and went to sleep. And the next day, actually, I needed to go home. And I was so sorry to leave them. And they were just such lovely, lovely beings. And there's more to the story, but I'll let you wait and read about that in my book. But uh, that was an amazing, amazing experience. And I enjoyed it so much. It was much hugging and tears when I left. I really, really miss those those beings. It was an amazing, amazing experience. So I thought I would share that one with you. So um, my time's quickly passing. I want to tell you about one more experience that's completely different again. Hi guys, break time for a short message. YouTube will not monetize me. So if you enjoy my content and want to support my efforts, help me to cover my expenses by visiting my shop to buy yourself a beautiful Orgone Generator. Zendome's Organite are my unique brand, and they are ethically sourced, handmade, and double-charged for maximum effect. They are only available through my website, www.karenholtonhealthcoach.com. Many people are finding comfort with Zendome's organ Generators, commonly called Organite. They are a simple compound which balance ambient energy by converting negative energy and EMF into positive healing energy with many easily confirmed health benefits. They are a simple compound with alchemic and energetic properties. These devices function as self-driven, continuously operating, highly efficient negative to positive energy transmutation factories. They help diminish the harmful effects of electromagnetic frequency radiation by attracting and converting negative energies, retuning them into new and more healthful sound and light wave patterns. And they help to purify the atmosphere and accelerate plant growth. They also help stimulate positive mood and are a natural remedy for poor sleep patterns. When Organite is within range of any corded or wireless electronic device, it will efficiently and continuously transform that energy into Orgon as it is being transmitted. This essentially creates Orgon energy transmitters out of any and all emitters of harmful negative energy. You can use these devices for focusing the mind, healing, meditation, and for spiritual growth. Zendome's Organite are my unique brand of organ generators, and they are only available through my website. Don't be fooled by imitations. Check out my website to see my latest selection at www.karenholtonhealthcoach.com. That's K-A-R-E-N-H-O-L-T-O-N healthcoach.com. Check them out today. Now, let's get back to the show. And this was um, an experience that I had while I was doing what I call the exopolitical ambassador work. So when I do that kind of work, I am very aware that I'm there etherically. I'm not there physically. 
So the first two experiences that I shared, I'm very much there physically. I have no idea how this works. All I know is that it happens for me and I'm sure it happens for other people too. In fact, I know it does. And, um, but anyway, it was, uh, we were communicating about a model that could be used for worlds that are finally sick and tired of war and the uneven distribution of resources, and they're ready for a new plan to put into action. Now, I think that this plan would work on here on Earth, but we have to uh, want peace and fairness and justice more than what we want uh, materially or more than what when we want war or economic gain. And I think we're coming to that place and I think it could be even sooner than we think. And um, so I want to tell you a bit about uh, this amazing um, plan. I'm not going to get into it in great detail. It could be a whole podcast on its own, and perhaps I will one day. But I'm going to start off by um, uh, just basically, I'm going to include a few visual overlays with this video to help you to get a better understanding of, uh, of this plan. So the plan starts with a planet and I'm gonna use the globe earth model here. Um, it actually would apply for a flat earth model. Uh, it would just be more of a, you know, if you look down on the top of a pie and you cut that pie across in several places, you would have different pie pieces. That's how you would interpret it but I'm gonna interpret it as this uh, globe model. Now, some of you might be saying, why are you including flat earth? And I, I'll tell you why, is because people perceive reality differently. And I would not wanna discount anybody's reality, even if it's different than, than, than my reality. So, um, but I'm going to, for the majority of people, present this as a globe earth. And so here I will include uh, a globe earth symbol um, to show you what I'm talking about. So it starts out with a globe earth as we would see it from, I guess, space as we understand it. And from there, um, there would be zones created. Now, instead of the countries that we have now, we would have zones that were vertical. So they would run from pole to pole, from the North Pole all the way to the South Pole. And then they would be uh, basically lined up next to each other until the whole world was basically like a beach ball having these different zones. And each zone would have a different purpose. So whatever purpose that you resonate with the most, that's the zone that you would want to move to or country, you could call it a country. And so there would be these different zones that would be there for um, all different kinds of purposes. Now you might be saying, well, how's that gonna work? Because some of those north to south pole zones are gonna be over water with no land. And I'd say, yeah, exactly. But guess what? When we stop wasting our research and development on, um, on products that are destructive, on the war machine, on the global um, military industrial complex. Just think of how we could spend our energy, our time, our creative abilities, our resources in creating all kinds of ways that we can live where it's very, very cold, where it's very, very warm, or even above the water, beneath the water, on the water, there's so much space on this earth, you wouldn't believe it. This whole idea of overpopulation is bullshit. There's enough room for everybody. Just some of these cities that we're all packed into, you know, are overcrowded and give us the illusion that there's no more room, but that's not true. The other reason why these zones would run from the North Pole to the South Pole is because then everybody gets a piece of the equator Everybody gets a piece of that beautiful zone between the, the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, where it's very comfortable to live. 
And people would also, um, fewer people, but some people would also perhaps want to live where it's cold for a number of different reasons, especially if we have the technology to provide comfort to everybody and food to everybody. So some of these zones that are more over land might produce more of the agricultural um, needs for the planet. Some might serve as sanctuaries for animals and different animal species. Some that are over water might serve as um, sanctuaries for the cetaceans. And we've got a lot to learn from these amazing, amazing um, beings that are right here on Earth. The whole um, planet has not even really been discovered. All the energy has gone on to research and development for technology. And so we don't even know what's what's within the ocean or what's within some of the different areas on this planet and what's possible. So uh, that's why I'm saying, just checking my notes. So from a side view, it would look very much like a beach ball. And from a top view, it would very much look like a sliced pie. And if you were a flat earther, you would see it as a sliced pie model. And if you're a global, globe person, as I'm going to present it today, you will see it very much like divided like a beach ball. Now, each of those zones would then be color coded. And so you'll notice from uh, looking at the progression of the colors that there are colors that are more suited to be side by side. And the same would be true for these different livable zones. So some of them you know, would resonate closest to its neighbor on its border. And this uh, actually uh, uh, um, contributes to the peaceful relations and the trade between zones. And of course, there would be free trade from everywhere, and it would be a wonderful thing. And so as you can see, if you take red, red would be bordered on one side by violet and on the other side by orange because they resonate closely with each other. Then the orange zone would be bordered on one side by red and on the other side by yellow. And so it would progress. Green would be bordered by yellow and then by blue. And blue would be bordered by green on one side and perhaps indigo on the other. And so it would go back to violet again. And in this way, we have more peaceful relations, especially along the borders and less competition. Now, as we go flow from one color panel to another, there's graduations and the same thing would be with these zones. So these vertical North Pole to South Pole zones would be at their truest color. And the color simply represents the belief systems, the purposes, the ideo ideologies, um, and the comfort zones of the people that live within that zone. And as you slowly move towards the next zone, you know, thoughts, ideas, ways of being change slightly. And we become gradually closer and closer to the zone beside us. And this would again help to um, establish more peaceful relations. Now, when you're we're gonna move from the macrocosm down into the microcosm, how would these zones be, be um, governed? And this is really important. So today we see all governance coming from the top down. And the top, uh, be, people at the top don't have a friggin' clue what the people at the bottom or, or the grassroots people or the majority of the population want or need. They're just making these decisions based on their own philosophical belief systems. And it's not working, clearly, clearly it's not working. So we're gonna turn that upside down and it now is going to be a grass roots or bottom of the pyramid is going to be where all the decisions and the information is going to come from. And if you're familiar with multi-level marketing, think about it as reverse multi-level marketing. It works exactly the opposite way. So uh, if you want to look at it as a pyramid, it means that the base of the pyramid would be at the top. And the um, bottom of the pyramid would be the peak. So just turn a pyramid upside down or think of it as reverse multi-level marketing. So what that means is each of these 
color zones. Now they're not literally that color. This is just um, a conceptual tool to give you an idea how this could work. Each one of those is full of different inhabited areas and some uninhabited areas. So we would look at neighborhoods and I'm using words that are common to us now, although the zones and the areas might be called something different when this plan, if this plan actually comes into fruition. So when you think about your neighborhood, okay, think about your neighborhood, think about maybe 12 blocks in each direction from where you live. That neighborhood would then assign someone to represent them. They would have meetings. So common people would say, this is what we need. This is what's working in our area. And this is what's not working in this area. And they would filter that information to the person that they've either elected or appointed as being their representative. That representative would then go and meet with um, what I would call a circuit. And a circuit is a number of neighborhoods. And those um, representatives of each neighborhood would then elect or appoint someone who represents them. And that would be a circuit. So it'd be like a circuit director. And that information would then filter to the circuit director. The circuit directors would then meet up with um, different perhaps city directors that are e even larger populations are now represented and would present the information. So you see the flow is going from the people to the neighborhood, to the um, circuit, to the city, and the so on and so on. And the cities would then um, appoint or elect a representative that would be in charge of a region. Well, not in charge, they're taking their marching orders from the grassroots, but they would represent a region. And then different regions would appoint an elder or a leader or representative, probably leader is not the right word, a representative that would go on and represent larger areas. And this would go on and on and on until you get to the whole zone from the North Pole to the South Pole. Now, I think at that point, one person is not going to do it for the job, probably would be a council, possibly 12 people who would then represent the different regions who would come together and bring the will of the people to the zone. And then there would be these, these meetings that are with um, each zone would come together. And in that way, trade, everything that we need would be facilitated and all of our needs would be met. And it's a pretty cool idea and completely backwards to the way things are done on Earth today. Now, as some of you would know, everything we experience on Earth today is an inversion. You take all the things that are going on and not working, they're inversions of what would work. And so this model of how we could organize this planet is also, you know, been inverted. So let's turn it back on its head and put the power back with the people. And no, I'm not approving of this ad. <laughs> I'm not running for politics. This is something quite different than politics. This is this is the people having the power and the power being, being manifest in reality, and this could work. So I'm not saying this is definitely the plan that's gonna happen, but I'm saying it's a plan. And as with everything I say, it's not meant to give you direction. It's meant to give you a jumping off point so that you can use your own mind and your own will and your own awareness to come to some different conclusions to find solutions to what's going on here on planet Earth today. So um, that's basically the three uh, different experiences I wanted to share with you. These are just uh, examples of what transdimensional travel or communication can do for you. And you probably notice I'm doing quite a few shows about transdimensional reality because I want you to see it's a real thing. It's not made up and it's so cool. And I think that, um, and the people who share these experiences with me, we all agree we're not some kind of special kind of evolutionary people. We're pretty ordinary. We're flawed and we're ordinary, like just like everybody else. But we're having these amazing experiences. And I think it's time that they were given validity 
And in future upcoming um, shows on the Quantum Guide Show, I'm going to be interviewing uh, more people that are having these experiences. And again, it's not like you have to believe us. It's just use these experiences as jumping off points to stimulate your own wisdom, your own imagination, and let's make this a better world. So that's it for today. I want to thank you for joining me. I love you all very much. Without you, I would not even have a show. I appreciate you so very much. If you want to help support my work, please do visit my shop at my website. All the links are below. And I wish you the very best week ever. And I'll see you next week on the Quantum Guide Show. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for joining me for the Quantum Guide Show. Become the change that you wish to see in the world. Subscribe to my YouTube and other channels at Karen Holton TV. Click the like button, leave me a comment, and share this podcast with your friends. Check out my website at www.karenholtonhealthcoach.com to see my free resources and amazing products and services. All the links will be in the description below. As part of the Forbidden Knowledge Network, you will find the Quantum Guide Show with Karen Holton and also the Aliens and Angels podcast on all audio platforms. Until next time, keep up the good work.